Hey guys, Brent Hull, Build Show, talking today about plinth blocks. <laughs> Everything you wanted to know about plinth blocks, but we're afraid to ask. Today on the Build Show. Okay guys, so a plinth block, right? Why is it called a plinth block and what is it? Well, if we look at the, the classical architecture from my ICAA slides, the plinth is this piece down here. It is the piece that supports the column. It is typically a square block, okay? There's plinths for buildings. So if a big building, three or four story building, has a real strong base, it's sometimes called a plinth. So this plinth is this grounding piece. If we look at this column base and then plinth, right? This is the square thing. And a plinth block on a door casing, because the plinth block by the classical rules holds the top of the column, okay? Look at it as your doors is actually having a little column that it needs to sit on something and that's why you have plinth blocks under door casings. Here's an example of a time when you probably need a plinth block. So let's say guys that you're doing a house and you've got this big base and the homeowner or someone says hey I want to put a big base cap on there and all of a sudden your molding that the base did fit behind your door casing. Now when you add this base cap on top it actually sticks past the the door casing right. You need something heavy to catch this bigger base. All the moldings work together, right? The, the casing as it drops down catches the base. The chair rails that comes across would ideally be caught behind the door casing, right? When moldings start leaking over each other, it's like, where do I stop? Where do I put these things? And a plinth block is this tool, right, to help solve this situation. So realize, guys, that in the classical period, pre-industrial, Georgian Federal Greek Revival era, right, the plinth block was really important. And we're looking at some, you know, Drayton Hall is one of my favorite houses in America, 1740s, 1750s. In the main room, when you walk right in off the, the front porch, you see this beautiful room and this really strong gray black line that runs around the room. That is the plinth. So the way they looked at it was it is a grounding piece. It was a supporting piece that supported the whole rooms. One of my favorite builders, William Buckland, in two of his houses also does a plinth. In Gunston Hall, in the entry hall there, you see this strong black line that runs around the room. And notice those columns, when they sit down there, they are sitting on the plinth. And notice that those doors don't even have a plinth block, that the doors are a casing that runs down, but the columns actually sit on a plinth. Okay. Okay. And then if you go to his other house in Maryland, the Hammond Harwood house, you see this beautiful mahogany line that runs around the room. If you look at the historic precedents in the Georgian Federal and Greek Revival going into the Victorian period, they do change, okay? If you look at Port Royal or some of the high style houses in Philadelphia, they just have a block that looks like this, okay? In the Georgian period, right, we have this plinth that is a very strong plinth that runs around the room like you saw in those historic historic rooms. And so what I've done here is I've shown how in a Georgian situation, I've actually cut this base. This is a, a Windsor base. It was actually this tall, okay, but I've actually cut it down to match up with the same height as the plinth so that if you wanted to paint it black or you wanted to treat it, it is the same height and it's communicated the same way these historic rooms are communicated, where this really strong base runs across and it's communicated by this really heavy, thick plinth at the bottom of the door. Now, in that Georgian style, okay, there are, there are examples of Georgian rooms with plinths on door casings. There's very high style rooms without plinths on door casings. So it's not necessarily the finest houses had plinth blocks and the simple houses didn't, right? It, it varied, and so yours can vary as well. Now, if you go into the federal period, right, when you get into the federal era, plinth blocks actually get taller, okay? And so what happens is, is the plinth now is going to be the same height, the plinth with the base cap, right? And so now, instead of having a squatty plinth like this, we actually have a very tall plinth, right? To actually catch the whole molding. And so this, this molding comes across here, the entire base with the base cap dies into the plinth, right? So now the plinth has increased in size. You'll also notice in this federal period that sometimes those plinths are shaped. You, where you're cutting in, right? So the plinth doesn't stick out quite as far. Sometimes it's shaped just the same shape as the molding 
just a little bit further out. That's probably more typical of how you're seeing plinths done today, but know that the historic precedent is kind of this heavy block. When you get into the Victorian period, everything kind of goes crazy, right? The plinth is actually grows even taller and it catches the entire base and base cap typically. There are three pages of plinth blocks in an 1892 catalog of the Victorian style. All different kinds of ornamentation, all different kinds of detail. And so the plinth block is fairly popular in the Victorian era. After the turn of the century into the 1900s, the period revival, the arts and crafts era. In fact, when we did this arts and crafts room a couple weeks ago on the build show, you'll notice that this molding, there actually is a plinth on this, on this casing. Now this is a holdover in my mind of, of the Victorian era, but the plinth is, is used in this package and it's available in that Windsor package. Going into the colonial revival era, you see all kinds of variety, right? You see things that actually copy pretty close to the Georgian era, maybe are a mix of the Georgian and federal, but it's a whole mix. Now what do you do, right? I've explained all this stuff. I've maybe even made it more confusing, right? Realize that there isn't really a hard and fast rule on plinth blocks, okay? Do you have to use one? No. In fact, there is examples of high style houses with them and high style houses without them. So it becomes for you a design tool. I really like plinths sometimes because they ground the house, okay? They ground a door casing. They establish a firm identity, okay? Now, I'll sometimes put a plinth block on a main cased opening because it's a really important area and not a plinth block on some other doors that aren't as important, right? It becomes this tool of, of a hierarchy. I know guys sometimes like to get a 12 inch, you know, eight inch, 10 inch tall base. I don't, I actually like a really short base. I don't want my bases more than about six inches tall, mainly because I oftentimes want to use paneling and things like that. And a tall base gets in the way of all the paneling, okay? The plinth block then becomes this tool that helps ground the room, right? Helps pull these things together. So if you remember that in the Georgian period, you have these very strong, stout, heavy blocks. In the federal period, they become much taller and thinner and daintier, right? You begin to get into the personality of these things and you can begin to use the plinth block as a design tool right to help your houses to help your doors look better okay guys understand plinth blocks can be confusing but realize there's no hard and fast rules there's a lot of historic precedent a lot of ability for you to show off your design tools right it can solve problems for you solve how a base will meet a casing it can create height right if it's tall it can create strength if it's low and fat right all those things should be tools in your design toolbox right to help design and build better things follow me on instagram and facebook a lot of behind the scenes things we're doing there that uh, can help you build better be sure to sign up for the newsletter i'm brent hull thanks for watching